Throughout the Middle Ages, and right up until the 19th century, Green Dyke Lane was the last part of the route by which the freemen of Walmgate Ward brought their livestock, mainly milk cows and horses, out to graze on the ancient summer pasture of Low Moor. Once on the common, the livestock were free to wander around, or stray. Walmgate Ward was the part of York within the city walls on this side of the River Foss, and Low Moor was Walmgate's stray. Each of the four wards that made up the ancient city had its own designated area of summer pasture, but only one of those areas lay within the traditional boundary of the city, and that was Micklegate's stray, which included the Knavesmire. The other three, including Walmgate's stray, lay outside the city's boundaries, occupying land that belonged to the outlying townships, in this case the township of Fulford. But because the citizens of York had always been short of grazing land, they had negotiated what was known as a customary right to share these pieces of land every summer with the freemen of the outlying townships. During the winter months, their animals were tethered on the arable fields, keeping the weeds in check after the harvest and manuring the land in the process, a very efficient solution for all concerned. By the 13th century, the origins of this system were already lost in the mists of time, a distant era referred to even then as time out of mind or time immemorial. Today, we tend to think of commons as land that's open to everyone, but until the First World War, that absolutely was not the case. A common was owned by the lord of the manor within which it lay, and it could only be used by freemen who were the wealthy merchant middle class. These traditional grazing rights were so important to the people of York that each year the high officials of the city would ride the bounds, a procession that followed the perimeters of all the common lands where the citizens claimed ancient rights. By 1721, when the last of these processions took place, we're told that the event had basically become a four-day debauched party on horseback. It's hard to imagine all the great and good of the city of York riding down here in all their finery with their retinues following them behind. And when the city expanded its boundaries in 1884, all four strays were shrewdly brought within the new administrative area. New gates were erected and all were imprinted with the coat of arms of the city of York. Landscape investigation gives us a clue about just how ancient the tradition of grazing here was. This 100 foot wide corridor of land used to be known as Lower Green Dyke Lane. The decaying hedge line on my left takes its line from the alignment of the lost Green Dyke. Here it marks not only the boundary between the townships of Heslington and Fulford, but also the boundary of the university campus. And now that you know what Ridge and Furrow looks like, you'll be able to tell that this corridor of land was never ploughed in the Middle Ages. By contrast, the land on both sides was. We can even see faint traces of Ridge and Furrow that have survived the landscaping of the university campus. That means that Lower Green Dyke Lane was carefully left unploughed to act as a droveway to Low Moor right from the very start of medieval arable agriculture, which may have been a century or more before the Norman conquest. At the bottom of Lower Green Dyke Lane, the ground drops away abruptly. About 14,000 years ago, this slope marked the shore of a vast shallow lake, like the one overlooked by the famous Mesolithic hunting settlement at Star Car. And because this narrow strip of land has never been ploughed, this area could offer unique potential for unusually good preservation. So, here we are. Low Moor. The clue's in the title. Unlike arable agriculture, grazing livestock don't leave many signs of their presence. But artificial watering places are one common clue. Livestock arriving at Low Moor 
would have been thirsty after walking more than a mile from Walmgate. So there used to be a drinking pond here. It was filled in when the adjacent cycle path to the university campus was constructed. But that was only a partial success because the pond was undoubtedly fed by one of the many springs at the foot of the glacial ridge, where the sands and gravels meet the impermeable clays beneath. Consequently, the site of the pond often floods in winter. Further along the ridge, it was another of these springs that supplied water to the Elizabethan ornamental canals of Heslington Hall, and later to the Victorian boating pond that replaced them and eventually, from the 1960s onwards, to the university's much larger artificial lake. Drainage operations are another symptom of livestock management. It was important to get the land fairly dry because while sheep don't mind getting their feet wet, horses and cows easily get foot rot. The first step was to dig out the channels of the existing natural streams. We can identify these because their courses meander gently. The next step was to dig completely artificial drainage ditches, leading from any particularly boggy areas to feed into the existing channels. These are all dead straight. By the 16th century, each ward had appointed a pasture master whose responsibilities included keeping the ditches in good working order, maintaining the boundary hedges, and ensuring that the freemen didn't ex exceed their stint, that is, the quota of animals that each was allowed to keep here. This is one of the really wet parts of Low Moor. It floods every winter. Here we're at the head of one of the natural streams that used to meander across the stray. Although the River Ouse is less than half a mile west of here, all these streams flowed in the opposite direction, towards what is now the university campus. This boggy hollow may look rather unexciting, but it could well be an incredibly important archaeological resource. I strongly suspect that if we took a corer and pushed it as far into the ground here as it would go, we would find several metres of waterlogged silts that might contain all sorts of information about the past environment, pollen, seeds and other plant material, potentially going right back 14,000 years The former medieval fields on the outskirts of York offered the only real opportunities for the city to expand as the Industrial Revolution swelled the urban population. In 1795, a cavalry barracks was built at one end of a block of ridge and furrow that adjoined the ancient common. Its site is now occupied by North Yorkshire Police Headquarters. The cavalry weren't mechanised until the Second World War, so the stray remained a useful resource for the horses for 150 years. You can still see the doorway through which they were brought out to exercise, and the rings on the wall where they'd be tethered while the stables inside the barracks were cleaned out. The army barracks, which is still in use, wasn't built until 1877. Even today, the regiments stationed here use the stray for fitness training. In the First World War, too, the troops were marched out to train on the stray. Perhaps surprisingly, there are very seldom documents that record the details of day-to-day -day training. But here, we've got a practice trench, deliberately filled in, but still pretty obvious. <laughs> Trenches were dug on lots of commons around Britain during the First World War to rehearse manoeuvres, for shooting practice, and just for fitness training too. There are at least six of them scattered around the edges of the common here. These are classic frontline fighting trenches, the crenellated plan designed to limit the damage done by shell blasts and machine gun fire. A little way away, there's an example of a communication trench with a shallow zigzag pattern 
designed to allow troops to move along it more quickly. Here, just next to the first trench, we've got a more unusual type of military earthwork. In fact, we've got three pairs of them. In the first few months of the war, as the terrible muddy conditions on the Western Front became clear, soldiers were taught how to adapt shell holes that had been blown in no man's land. And the first thing they were taught to do was to dig a little gully to drain as much of the water out as possible. And that meant that they were less likely to drown and less likely to freeze to death and less likely to be shot as well if they had a bit of extra cover. So these could be heavy weapons pits for mortars or heavy machine guns. But I think what they most closely resemble are replica shell holes. And to be honest, I find that really chilling. There's something really evocative about these. Now, I want to tell you a cautionary tale about the reliability of people's memories. When I first came down onto the Stray, just over 20 years ago, I was told by an old boy who lived locally that when the Luftwaffe bombed York in April 1942, hello dog, one of the bombs hit the barracks just over there and blew up a whole load of trucks that were parked in very close formation. After that, he said, the army realised what a stupid mistake it had made and began to park all its vehicles around the edges of the stray, hidden under the overhanging trees and hedge lines and well spread apart so that, only, so that only one vehicle would be destroyed if a bomb hit. Sounds pretty plausible, huh? And behind me, crossing this patch of boggy ground between the barracks over there and the foot of the glacial ridge over there, is a broad low bank. If you look at it in summer you can see parched marks on the surface, long rectangular strips. If you scrape away at those of your, with your boot it turns out there's timber right underneath the surface of the turf and I'm pretty sure that those are railway sleepers. Railway sleepers here, just as on a railway itself, serve to spread heavy loads on this boggy ground. Heavy loads like lorries, so that all seems to support the old boy's story. But there's one big problem, because if you look at the aerial photograph taken only hours after that bombing raid in April 1942, the track is clearly visible. In other words, it had been built long before and the army were well and truly prepared for bombing raids on York. We've now left Low Moor by stepping up onto the foot of the glacial ridge. It's a tiny change in height, less than half a metre, but it makes a huge difference. The landscape abruptly changes. As you can see behind me, the ground is much drier and those big wide ridges you can see, well, yes, they're more ridge and furrow. So that tells us that this was once an arable field, not part of the ancient common. So why is it part of the common now? Until 1828, there was a hedge dividing the two different areas of land. But in that year, a whole chunk of land on the slope, stretching all the way up to Heslington Road, was bought for the freemen and bolted onto the ancient common. Why did this happen? Well, as York grew in the early 19th century, more and more of the individual fields where the freemen had kept their livestock over the winter months were being sold off and, as we've seen, some of them were being developed. The powerful freemen complained bitterly and in 1828 they were compensated, to some degree, by the acquisition of this land. The addition of this strip immediately created a much more convenient way of accessing the ancient common via a gate on Heslington Road. Almost overnight, the ancient route along Green Dyke Lane became of secondary importance. This cottage was built next to the new gate to house a herdsman, whose job it was to police the common and look after the grazing livestock. 
These trees are a much happier symptom of the First World War than the practice trenches we looked at earlier. After the terrible hardships and sacrifices made during the Great War, people felt they had a right to enjoy the green and pleasant land they'd fought for. It was at this time, immediately after the war, that the concept of common land as we understand it today, that is, as a space available to be used and enjoyed by everybody, was born. As the purpose of the stray shifted from grazing land to amenity land, this line of trees, or at least earlier versions of these trees, was planted to give the landscape a more park-like feel. And rather nicely, because the trees were planted parallel to the boundary of the retreat, they too follow that sinuous curve of the medieval fields. I just love the fact that the lazy habits of oxen influenced events more than a thousand years later. The medieval practice of night soiling, in other words, spreading sewage and domestic rubbish on the arable fields as a form of fertiliser, means that almost every molehill you see on this slope contains some kind of artefact. By contrast, Low Moor has thousands of molehills, but you never see a single artefact because of the long history of grazing down there. Low Moor allotments were also laid out on the common land after World War I, another concession to what we might today call broadening public access. In fact, local people had been asking for land where they could grow their own food all through the deprived years of the war, but their request wasn't granted until 1919. People often assume that allotments originated with the Dig for Victory movement in the Second World War, but in this case, the sequence of old ordnance survey maps show us that these allotments had actually been massively reduced in area by the time the Second World War began. As we walk up this gentle slope, we start to see various minor humps and bumps of different shapes and sizes. It's difficult to detect much of a pattern. So now I'd like to give you an antidote to the cautionary tale I told you earlier. When I first came down to the stray, several people asked me if I wanted to see the ancient burial mound and they brought me to this spot. Well, it only took me a few minutes to point out to them that this couldn't really be an ancient burial mound because, rather like Seawood's Howe, it's sitting on top of Ridge and Furrow. But beyond that, I wasn't really sure what these were. Just down slope, we've got another mound, similar but slightly smaller. And in this case, the material to build it seems to have come not only from the hollow next to it, but also from a series of small pits, including this one here, which cuts right through our First World War trench, implying that the mounds are all post-First World War. Sometimes, examining things really carefully as you walk over them is enough to work out what they are and how they relate to other features. But sometimes, you need to make a plan. So that's what we did. But to be honest, even with an accurate plan in front of me, I was still completely mystified as to what these were. In the end, I had a chat with Roger, who used to have the allotment just there. And he said, oh, I used to come down here when I was a boy because my dad had this allotment before me. And at that I pricked up my ears because he must have been in his mid seventies even then. And Roger explained to me exactly what this was. During the Second World War, the barracks here was responsible for delivering fitness training to recruits who'd failed their basic training at Catterick Camp. So there was lots of square bashing, lots of long runs, and of course, an assault course. And the Sergeant Major used to be barking at the new recruits, shouting, You useless, you can't do anything, you're lazy. 
Come on, lads. Come out and show them how to do it. And Roger and his mate used to come out here and they used to do whatever obstacle it was the new recruit couldn't do. And Roger used to love that. So he remembers every detail of every obstacle that formed part of this assault course. There are some obstacles here that we could barely have guessed at based on the archaeological evidence. So that is the value of oral history. We've been following the perimeter of the Retreat Mental Hospital since we first stepped onto Lower Greendike Lane. It's a fascinating landscape in its own right and an institution of international importance. But I'm afraid there simply isn't time to discuss it today. The mound beyond the boundary wall of the Retreat up ahead is called Lamel Hill. When I first moved to York in 1999, there was a little octagonal summer house on the top, which had stood there for about a century, allowing patients at the retreat to enjoy views in every direction. But this mound has a much longer history, which we can directly compare with the mound where we started our walk, nearly half a mile away now. Ah! To start with, we know that until the retreat purchased this land in 1836, there was a windmill on the top. It was in such a bad state of repair that it was immediately dismantled. We know it had stood there since at least 1644, because it's referred to by writers in General Fairfax's Parliamentarian Army when they established a gun battery at the foot of the mound during the Civil War siege of York. Presumably the top of the windmill would have made an excellent observation point for fine-tuning the aim of the guns, which were firing at Walgate Bar and the adjacent walls. Now, I mentioned at the end of the first film that documents of the 14th and 15th centuries refer to a windmill called Seawoods Howe Mill. So could this be the real Seawoods Howe? Recently, research by the local history society has brought to light some very suggestive field names. And we have some interesting archaeological evidence that might support that theory too. To begin with, we should think about what we can deduce from field survey. Unfortunately, not much, because the surface traces of the all-important relationship between the mound and the medieval ridge and furrow have been erased by gardening activity within the grounds of the retreat. All the same, it looks as though the furrows are curving round quite sharply before they reach the mound. In other words, that they are later than the mound. In 1847, workmen constructing a spiral path leading to the top of the mound started to dig up human bones. They reported this to the retreat's medical director, Dr John Thurnham, an expert on skulls who later excavated several early Neolithic long barrows in Wessex. Thurnham then excavated a broad shaft right down to the base of the mound. In the upper layer, he found a jumble of disarticulated bones, but in the bottom four feet of the mound, he found almost 30 intact skeletons, all with their heads to the west, some with wooden coffins, but none with grave goods. Thurnham inferred probably quite correctly, that the construction of the windmill mound, possibly in two phases, had disturbed an Anglian Christian burial ground, probably dating to the 7th to 8th centuries. In 1983, when these flats were being built, more skeletons were found, suggesting that the burial ground must have extended right across this strip of the stray, although here it must have been damaged by medieval and later ploughing. Back in 2013, as a teaching exercise, we carried out some geophysical survey here, but unfortunately couldn't identify any definite graves. But Thurnham found something else in the mound. At its exact centre, he found a pot, which almost certainly held a cremation. And that pot is still kept at the retreat. And nowadays, we can tell that it's Roman, not Anglian. The Romans did build earthen burial mounds, but this pot is just not very posh, not the sort of thing that you'd expect to find in a major monument. So I think it's highly likely that both the Roman cremation and the Anglian Christian burials were inserted into an even earlier mound. 
given this highly visible location in the landscape, I think it's possible that the original mound was constructed in the Bronze Age. So I hope this tour has given you some insights into how both the physical character of the landscape that we've inherited and the varied ways in which we perceive it today have been profoundly influenced by the past. And yet, if you ask people what they value about Wongate Stray, nobody mentions history or archaeology or the past at all. They invariably say things like... And where I can just walk and walk. Just a slice of nature. Rabbits, 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 rabbits. Two effects worms and lots of them. All those perceptions are completely valid, of course. Landscape is, or should be, a unifying concept, and archaeological heritage is just one part of a much bigger picture. But by now, you must be wondering where I'm standing. Well, we've come right across the, to the other side of the city, to the Church of St Olav's, just outside Museum Gardens. So this is where you might start to feel that I've been stringing you along because the Anglo-Saxon chronicles imply that Earl Seawood was buried here, in this church which he himself founded and dedicated to a warrior saint from Scandinavia. And I'm afraid there's worse to come. If you can cast your minds back to the start of the first film, I said that how can mean a burial mound. Well, that's true, but it can also just mean a hill. And I'm afraid it gets worse still. Recent research by Dr. Louise Wheatley of the local History Society has discovered that in the mid 12th century, the Lord of the Manor of Fulford was a man by the name of Seawood, probably a descendant of Earl Seawood of Northumbria, but a century later. And that's precisely the period when the name Seawood's Howe is first recorded in the documents. <laughs> So, clearly, landscape investigation can't give us all the answers. Never mind. The important bit, and the fun bit, is just asking the questions. Iris, why do you like the stray? Well, I like the stray because I've had two dogs in my lifetime. They both love running wild on the stray. And um, I was almost born in an allotment. Remember lots of more, uh, make more lots of more. Can you start that again? <laughs>